today we're going to talk about knowing the Trinity. We're, we're in this series called Storm Proof Life. And so we want, you know, after 2020 and now 2021, man, there's a lot of storms coming. We didn't expect them. They came. And Jesus said that a wise man builds his house upon a rock. And the rock is his word. He said, whoever hears my word and, and practices it is like a wise man that builds his house on a rock. So then he says, but the one that builds on sand, that means no, not practicing God's word, his house will collapse. We don't want anybody's families, marriages, the singles. We don't want your life to collapse. We want it to be strong. So what we did is we started a series on the doctrines of God. Because if that's your foundation, today we're on no, you know, it's, we want you to know what you believe. Today, we want you to know about the Trinity, and I think it's going to be super fun, super exciting. Uh, open in your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of Mark chapter 1. And um, we're going to get there in a minute, but my name is Neil Eaton, and I can't dance. Anybody else with me here? I try. I can't dance. Now, if, 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 dance, if dance was a metaphor for your life, what kind of dance would you have? Or would you be dancing at all? Right, so I, like, when I went to, like, the high school dance uh, back in the day, you know, way back in prehistoric times, like, I had to be under the influence of something to be dancing. I'm not proud of that, but um, because something, Gail, these need desperately to be cleaned. Don't mind me and my wife. Um, so um, I'm not proud of that, but, but watch. Like, so th there had to be something that I would, I would not... I would be able to sur surrender all, all dignity and self-respect because I wanted to get out there. I just didn't want to look like a fool. So I got to the place where I didn't care, right? And um, I would just dance some crazy chaotic dance. And if anybody ever captured that on Super 8 film back then, yeah, Super 8 film back then, uh, I would have been shamed for the rest of my life. Anyways, uh, some of us just, you know, I, I wonder, by the way, who can dance? Anybody can dance in here? Okay. You always make me jealous. Um, who can't dance? Okay, good. I have, I'm in good company. Got two left feet. So, um, when you think about life, like like if if my if dancing were a metaphor, what would I be like concerning um, that? Would you be like, you know, like the dancers? You remember that song, Kung Fu Fighting? Maybe you maybe you're kind of regarding your relationship with God. You're just fighting God, or maybe maybe you would um, be one of those wallflowers. You know. You're always, you're thinking about God, but you're super timid and you're kind of up against the wall, not quite sure. You don't have real confidence in, in joining the dance of God. Um, or maybe you're just like sitting, you know, the weddings, the reception, all these people are like staying at the tables. Like, I know most of you wish you could be out there. You just don't know what the heck you're doing, right? But may, maybe you're, you're kind of a, a back room dweller and you just don't want to jump into the party. I want to tell you something. God, God started a gigantic party when Jesus came. In fact, the first thing that Jesus did is he showed up and did a miracle at a wedding. And you know, being Jewish, that they danced. And so because they celebrate. So there, you know, we're all at all these places, you know, and uh, maybe, maybe your dance with God and maybe even with others is like the Viennese waltz, you know, that they're all dressed in uh, black tie affair, you know, and they're just kind of waltzing around. I won't embarrass you. I know when I dance, I just think about mowing the lawn, trimming the hedges, uh, whatever, right? It helps me. Or like I'm a drummer, so I can like just kind of beat the drum. It's really weird. Um, but I did take lessons after. But So when I was a kid, like, by the way, we went to a church growing up where I met my wife. Yeah, you really? You ready for this? It was a sin to dance. So guess what? In 1980, we got married. We did not dance at our wedding. And then I read the Bible. And I saw all through scriptures, 29, at least 29 different places in the Bible. Dance is a form of celebrating God and all of the glory and the goodness and the common grace that he gives to all of us. And I realized, what in the world? We, we didn't get to dance at our wedding? And we've regretted it all these years. Well, last August... 16th around that time oh no it was actually before that we i surprised gail we i planned this big backyard wedding but it was renewal of vows we did everything that we did at our wedding um 
Honeymoon was awesome, by the way, but no, kidding. So we did, every, we did everything at the wedding, but she didn't know that I had that surprise. So we had all our kids there because it was COVID, so we just had mostly family. And Gail comes on the scene, and her sons escort her, and I'm waiting down at the scene, and Caleb did our wedding, and it was super cool. Anyways, we finally got to do a wedding dance with all of our kids, with all of our... And you know what? Um, the thing about this is uh, we had taken ballroom uh, lessons like a few years ago with Mike and Susan Spellman. Um, I got some incriminating stuff on Mike Spellman, but I'll never use that against him. Anyways, um, unless, you know. Uh, anyways, so I found out that there's, a, if, if you just learn the choreography, if you kind of learn, we... Before that, we would step on each other's toes. It was super clumsy, but we learned some steps and we learned the box step. So now when we dance, it's got a flow. It's got a unity. We know where we're going. And that's what God wants us to do with him. God is in a big dance with the Trinity and he's inviting you to it and he wants you to participate in what he's doing. So that's kind of the gist of, um, I want you, we're gonna talk about the Trinity with that, that particular metaphor. So what is your, the dance of your life look like with God and with others? I wonder if you could describe it, how would you describe it? And so uh, do your primary relationships look like more like a drunk, non-harmonious chaos dance like I used to do or like a smooth waltz? I mean, what is it looking like? Because to the degree that you, you come to the Lord and you follow him and you're in, you're in a relationship with him, um, you, you come into a perfectly united, selfless, relational dance of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as they defer to one another with self-giving love. When the Godhead is the primary source of your relationships, I guarantee that we will begin to see a greater harmony in the primary relationships in our life. I, I'm telling you right now, I want to promise you that. If you're struggling in relationships, if you would come to know God, if you would come into relationship with him, where you allow your life to submit to his, you will have a difference in your relationships. Let's pray. Father God, we just ask you, God, that you would speak to us in this great truth of the Trinity. We ask you, God, I pray you'd meet every need, those who are brokenhearted, those who are, who are lost, those who are confused, those who are depressed, those who are filled with anxiety, those who are sick. Lord, we pray that you would show up and transform them. Give them hope and peace and love and grace and answers. God, speak to their soul. Heal their relationships. And Lord God, we pray for those who feel lonely that they would not. And they would know by the time today is over that they're not alone. And Lord, we just depend upon you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen, amen. So let's talk about the Trinity, shall we? Here's the basic about the Trinity. Here's the basics about the Trinity. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about the Trinity. We're going to break it down into three things as your map. We're going to talk about the language of the Trinity, the dance of the Trinity, and the invitation of the Trinity. Okay, you got that? Yeah. Thanks for the feedback. This is awesome. This is going good so far. All right, so uh, first I want to say the basic like, doctrine of the Trinity is there is one God that eternally exists in three persons. I would encourage you to write some things down. There'll be a lot of scripture. One God eternally exists in three distinct, everybody say distinct, persons. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And, and if we state this differently, we would look at it this way. God is one in essence and three in persons, Okay. Um, sometimes people say there are three who's in one what. What is the essence of God? And so when we look at this, I, I think this is, one of, this is the best uh, symbol image of the Trinity. So it tells us that um, God is, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But because they're each, each distinct, and it, by the way, it's one God. We'll talk about that in a minute. But because they're each distinct in their roles, the Father is not the Holy Spirit, the Son is not the Father, the Holy Spirit is not the Son, and vice all, all over the place. Like, they all have their own distinct selves. And there's three things, write these down if you can, is the, 
the, the definition I just gave you expresses three critical important truths. Here's, a, here's what they are. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three distinct persons. We established that, distinct, three distinct persons. They're distinct. And number two, each person is fully God. They're each fully God. And lastly, there is only one God. Now, that's like a mind bender, right? Because remember when you first tried to figure that out? Here's the bottom line. You can't figure it out. Why? Because the creator of the universe is infinite. God. The tri triune God is infinite, and we are finite. So we don't know how it all works, but I believe there'll be some aha moments when we go to be with God. We don't know how it all... So, um, what we do know, though, is that Scripture over and over and over shows us that God is in three persons. And so this is a God who uh, we believe in God being monotheistic. That means one theism, one God. Uh, do you guys, everybody say one God? So there is only one God. There is only one God, and that's monotheism. Polytheism is where there's multiple gods. Like India, they have millions of gods. Um, we believe, as the scripture tells us, there is only one God. In 1 Timothy, Paul writes to his protege, young Timothy, and he writes this, 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God, and there is one, one mediator between God and men. Who is it? The man. Why are you guys so shy? Let's have a conversation. Why are you guys just, everything Okay. There's one mediator between God and man, and his name is? His name is? All right, good. I like, I like life in our services. Maybe you're used to kind of super quiet, super traditional, but new hope is, is alive. Um, so there, there, there's the gospel right there. You were separated in your sins. You're a sinner. I am too. Separated from a holy God. Imagine a chasm. We just had like three homeless friends, Friday, during our homeless ministry, we feed them a hot lunch, Free homeless, uh, three homeless men received Christ, because I went off on a gospel preaching rampage in there, loving on those people. Awesome, Friday. And, um, but basically, imagine like there's a, a cliff on one side, right? And God is here at the edge, and then there's a chasm that stretches across like this, and then there's us sinners, so holy God, sinful people, a big chasm. We cannot bridge over to God, and so on the bottom is the fires of hell at the bottom. And so uh, we can't access God, and because of our sin, he's holy. He cannot be in the presence of unforgiven uh, sin, so we needed God. And God came up with a remedy. It was his solution to bring us and send to us Christ the Savior. And so if you can imagine the chasm and put a cross, the horizontal beam, and then the cross between, bridging the gap, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one mediator between God and men, Christ Jesus. He died on that cross, taking your place as a substitute. He took upon himself the, the, uh, the, the punishment that we deserved, and then we got the righteousness that we did not deserve. So... But, but, you know, Paul's saying to Timothy, there's one God. And then Deuteronomy, the Old Testament, part of the Pentateuch, chapter 4, verse 35, to you it was shown, declares God, that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other beside him. So this Judeo-Christian, this Christian gospel that we preach is one God, just one God. Uh, unlike, you know, where they came from in Egypt in the Old Testament, where there was multiple gods. And, well, I could go off on a whole sermon on that. But I'm, I'm, listen, church, I'm restraining myself right now. Okay, no side, no side journeys, okay? So then, not only is, is to say that the Lord is one, but, uh, I mean, that there's only one God, it also says the Lord is one. So think about that. There's only one God, the Lord is one. Of course the Lord is one. Like, how can somebody be anything but one? Right? So there's a reason that God says that, that the Lord is one, because you're going to discover when you read the scriptures all the times where you see 
the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So there's a reason that that's there because Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 in the Old Testament says this. Hear, O Israel. This is called the Shema, meaning hear. Listen, listen to this. Hear, O Israel. It's important. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's a declaration that had to be proclaimed. You with me? And so then you go to the New Testament and Paul proclaims the same thing. The Apostle Paul says to the church at Rome, in chapter 3, verse 30, he says, God is one. So we, we get that settled. Monotheistic um, uh, Christ, uh, understanding of who God is. But God is triune at the same time. What does triune mean? Everybody say triune. Tell the person next to you, triune. What does it mean? It means three in unity. <laughs> three triune God, three in unity, meaning that there is one God and he is undivided. Before the, uni the universe existed, there was the Trinity. This is crucial. Because you think about the universe or the earth or people or dogs or poodles being created, right? Out of what did everything come into existence? You ready? Everything came into existence by this one God and three persons. And the main, the main motivator, the main experience they had together was love. They loved one another. And out of the love between the three, the triune God, love always existed in the triune God. So when everything came into existence that we see and hear and breathe and hug and, and everything, it's because it came out of this love. They, they have a relation. It's a love relationship that came. The Godhead is perfectly unified with no division or friction whatsoever. And, and I've got all these scriptures. I've got two pages of scriptures that, that show us that uh, the Trinity exists. And, and even in, in single verses, you can find the Trinity. Let me give for you an example um, Romans, uh, well, let's go to Acts 10.38. You know Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him. So we got Jesus, we've got God with the Holy Spirit. So you got Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, and with power in how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. See, God, the whole Trinity, is behind the ministry to humankind. Like, all working together in unity to to reach us, to, to, uh, to heal us, to redeem us, to connect us. Like, it's amazing. Like, you could go on and on. So Romans 1, 4 says, Who has declared the Son of God, we get Son and God, with power by the resurrection from the dead. Christ died on the cross, but he rose according to the Spirit of holiness. So the Holy Spirit is revealing all that's true about God, the Father, and the Son. He's a revealing. In fact, right now, some of you may be, if you open your heart, would you do that? And open your mind, even if you're a, a mature Christian or you're not even, you're far from God, welcome. This is a place to be. Say, God, God, speak to me. Reveal yourself to me. And, and even in this message right here, you could have a revelation of God. So, um, and so Romans 8, 9, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. He's talking to born again Christians. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, if. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ. So you got the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ. You see how they're all like interchangeable. God, uh, the spirit's in God. God's in the spirit. The son's in the father. The spirit's in the son. It just goes like that. Um, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And I could just go on, look at two pages, on and on with scriptures that talk about uh, the Trinity, even though, guess what? Do you, how many of you believe that, that the, word of, the word Trinity is in the Bible? I don't want to make fools of you. I, I, I set you up for that. It's not. But the Trinity is in the Bible. The Trinity is actually in the Bible, just not the word God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is in the Bible. Now, uh, please turn to, to Mark, chapter 1. Did, did you already turn there? Did you already turn there? Mark, chapter 1, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. I want you to see something quickly here as we move along. 
in chapter 1, verse 1, we see this. The beginning, Mark chapter 1, verse 1, of the gospel of who? Jesus Christ, the? So what do we get? We get the deity of Christ right away at the opening of Mark's gospel, the beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus, the Deliverer, who is the Messiah, is the Son of God. And then when you go down a little further, um, he's quoting Isaiah, one of the prophets that prophesied uh, about Jesus 750 years before he came. He said, a messenger will go before you, and then he will, he will uh, prepare the way. Behold, I will send my messenger. That happened to be John the Baptist, the fulfillment 750 years later, before your face, who will prepare your way next the voice of the one crying, that's John the Baptist, in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the what? It's Jesus is Lord. We get the divinity of Christ right there in the opening pas passages. Twice over, Son of God, He is Lord. Now jump down, to, please, to verse, um, verse 9. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up, so we've got Jesus being baptized, right? Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Jesus being baptized in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. I love this. Now, the heavens are torn open. Jesus got back. What does he see? It says, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. Thank you. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So you've got, you get the son getting baptized in water, you've got the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove, and you've got the, the voice of the father saying, I love my son, this is him. Then the spirit drove him out, verse 12, into the wilderness, and in the wilderness, he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Interesting stuff. I wonder, so what do we've got? We've got the Father, we've got the Son, we've got the Spirit, we've got the water, we've got the devil. Let's go now to, does it remind you of any Old Testament passage? Any, any Old Testament passage does it remind you of? Will you get the Trinity? Anybody? Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, in the beginning, God created Elohim is the name of God. And what's interesting, the Hebrew word Elohim, uh, God created. Elohim is plural. So it provides within the word the ability for it to be more than one in terms of that God is one but in three persons. Does that make sense? So in the beginning, Elohim, God, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. All right, so what do we have here? We definitely have God, God, right? We, we know the Father. We definitely have the Spirit. Do we have Jesus? Do we? That's a good question, right? Do we have Jesus? Now watch this. It says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. God said. Now how do we know that Jesus actually is here? Come on, Bible scholars. Cross-reference. You go to John chapter 1. In the beginning. Now, John, the Gospel of John, the disciple of Jesus, is actually referencing Genesis 1. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, capital W. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who's the Word? It's Jesus, which is made very clear further down in the Gospel of John. We know that Jesus... So you've got the Trinity where at creation, why did God create this earth? Who was it for? It's for us. He said, I cre you, I, he made male and female, two genders, male and female, and then he, he, he wanted them to take dominion over the earth, and he said that the, out of all the creatures God made, he said that we are made in the image of God, in the image of God he made them. Male and female. So here we have, in the very beginning, the Trinity shows up for an epoch event, the epic event of creation. Now, 
Also, where do you see the Trinity show up at another great project? Redemption. What happened in between? The fall of man. Dun, dun, dun. Devil shows up. Not in Georgia. Looking for a soul to steal. <laughs> right? He shows up. Now, he shows up in Genesis, and then Adam's tempted, and they fall, and they plunge all of us into sin's depravity. Creation groans. Everything changes. We've been struggling with our own sin ever since. But God had a remedy. The next amazing event that we see all three showing up is Mark 1. At the redemption, the baptism, the outset, the inauguration of Jesus coming for you and for me. You know why? Because yes, you have, a, you have a moral record that you're not proud of. Yes, you have things that you've done. You've broken the law of God. You've done things, said things, thought things that you wish you never did. You have deep regrets. Some of you have d deep, dark secrets that you don't want anybody to know about. If they only knew what you thought about, if they only knew what you did when, when nobody was looking, if they only knew. But God knew, and guess what? He knows every deep, dark secret, and yet still because he loves you all of the trinity went to work so that they could bring redemption so you could be brought back into the dance with god because at in genesis uh, somebody cut in on that dance and it was satan and adam no longer he was broken he was banned from the garden a, a angel with a flaming sword in his hand came and kept them out but jesus brought you back in how many of you know that now, what's interesting is when you read the Targum, which is a translation, it's the Aramaic translation of the Hebrew scripture of the Old Testament. When you read the Targum, it actually has a version of the spirit, which is slightly different. And it says this, it says, um, it says, and God fluttered over the face of the deep like a dove. So Mark is connecting us right back to Genesis to show us that God is all in for our redemption. He's all in. He held nothing back so that you could be fully and utterly and completely reconciled with your God because you were separated. If you don't think that sin separates you from God, then we are mighty prideful, aren't we? And we got to come to a place of humility because Jesus did not die on a cross in vain. He had a great purpose to save us utterly and completely. Completely save us. So we went to the cross. So we have that. Now, I want to talk about three things really quick. The language of the Trinity, the dance of the Trinity, and the invitation of the Trinity. The language. Let's say, everybody say language. Number one, language. The language of the Trinity. What do we find God the Father saying that within this Trinity to his Son? He says, this is my boy. This is my son. By the way, fathers, it's so important to affirm your sons and your daughters publicly, correct privately, affirm, brag on publicly. God did it. He set the model. They need to hear your words. Some fathers are real good with the deeds, and praise God. Words without deeds lead to nothing. But when a dad and a mom, when we say words of affirmation of love, we speak them from our hearts sincerely, it builds people up, not just our children, but people. And then, of course, words without actions mean nothing. And so God is affirming his son. Why? Because he knows that he's obedient to go to the cross for the greatest action, the greatest action of love that ever happened in history. You with me right now? So the language of the Trinity is love. It always has been. It's always been love. The, the, you know, there's so, I can't even tell you how many, there's so many verses where Jesus said, the Father loves me, and he knows this, right? You gotta know it, that he loves you. You gotta know it. Otherwise, you will give away your virginity to anybody that comes just because they, they tell you they love you. You gotta know it because you will shape your identity on what another person says. The greatest way to have a rock, solid, immovable, strong, confident identity is to know that the Father who created you, that called you into existence, that you know that he loves you, that he loves you, that he loves you, and he'll never forsake you, never abandon you, never neglect you, never hurt you. He's always by your side. You walk around with such a confidence, head up, chest out, 
boldly going forward. My God loves me. He's with me. He's for me. He's, and he's not against me. So whoever is against me doesn't matter because I know who's for me. Come on, somebody. And, and so this is a love. And Jesus is like, my, my father loves me and I love my father. You can look the verses up. And he loves you. In fact, he says at one point in John 17, my father loves you, my disciples, those who are, that are his disciples. My father loves you, which, by the way, are you and I if we've received Christ. He loves you as much as he loves me. That blew my mind one day. I just wept when I read that. He loves you as much as he loves me is what Jesus was saying. You can read all this stuff. Look at John 17, 23, 26, John 3, 16, John 15, 9 through 10. I could give you tons of examples. But listen, the language of the Trinity is love. They love one another. Listen to this. A quote by Cornelius Plantiga says, At the center of the universe, uh, self-giving love is the dynamic currency of the Trinitarian life of God. Don't you like that? Yeah. Yeah, Pastor. Yeah, Pastor, we like that. Uh, <laughs> everything about the existence of the universe, everything uh, began from the Trinitarian love that was expressed all over this world. And listen, what we get is when we're in unity with God, we get the, 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 the we, we, we begin to be influenced by the perfect harmony and the community of the Godhead. I just love that. When you get right with God through Jesus, his divine love is poured out in your heart. How many of you could use some? Man, maybe your heart's empty. If you imagine your, your heart like, an, like a, a vase or, or like a jar, imagine now God just pouring his love into you. Then those who are unlovable, those who are driving you crazy, you can still love them. Why? Because you're not depending upon their words or actions of love toward you. No, no, no. You've already gone to the endless resource, to the generous portion of God's love that never runs out. You know that you can't find the depth. You can't find the height. You can't find the width. You can't find the love of God, which is in Christ. You can't measure it. It's immeasurable. Number two, I want to tell you, first, we've got the Trinity and the language of love. Second, we've got the the, the dance of the Trinity. Dance? You're like, this is just weird, Pastor Neil. Dance? Well, yes. Um, I love anybody here at Charles Spurgeon. Love what he said. He said, there is a natural delight. This is regarding the Trinity, their love for each other. In each other, in the persons of the blessed Trinity, so that each divine person delights to glorify the rest. God even thus glorifies himself. So you got this word. You might want to write it down. It's a Greek word. And it's uh, perichoresis, perichoresis. Peri means round, like kind of circle. Choresis is where we get the word choreography. So the Greek, the, the early church leaders in the Greek Christ, Christian culture, they said the Trinity, many of the church fathers, is like this perichoresis. In that, it's like, and what they mean by that, it means to flow around, it means to, to go around, it means to dance. It's where you get our word periscope, round, right? Um, so it, 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 it meant this, and Cornelius Plantiga said this. Each divine person harbors the others at the center of their being. In constant movement of acceptance, each person envelops and encircles the others. Perichoresis involves mutual movement of love and the communion of love in the Holy Trinity. So what you've got is you've got a God who is triune, one monotheistic God, who is one, in the, in the form of a triune Godhead, Father, Son, Holy, and they are all working for you in the greatest epics of all time were for you and I to come into the dance with God. He's bringing us in. When we were cut off, we were, that Satan cut us in, and he, he separated us, well, we did, because every time we sin, we choose that. But God is at work to make sure that we come back in. Now, there's, there's, everybody say the word glory. Now say the word glorify. What Jesus kept saying in John is he kept saying, I glorify the Father. The Father glorifies me. And so there's, there's this mutual glorifying going on in the Trinity. The, the, the Holy Spirit glorifies the Father and the Son. Do you get that? So what it, you say... 
ask yourself, what does glorify mean? Do you know what it means? It means to praise, to worship, to find beauty, to respond to beauty. Everybody look at your wife. Guys, look at your wife. You just, you better go, ah, come on, let's hear it, mutual. Ah, right? You're just in awe, right? So it means that when something's wonderful, you're full of wonder. You behold it. Just last week, Valentine's Day, all my family on Sundays, all my kids, the grandkids, as many as are here, or some of them, and they can, right, Kim? Try to show up at my house, and we have, we just get together as often as we can. Well, I had the balloon I gave Gil, big red heart balloon, and there were other helium balloons in the house for Valentine's Day. And little Winston, how old is Winston? He's about to be one. This guy, man, he, he was just in awe of these balloons. He had apparently never seen a balloon so big as these, uh, and he's just holding it. Look at that face. Let's zoom in on the face. Look at his face. That is, that is someone, we're going to go about another 10 minutes. Um, that is someone who is in awe, praising what he sees. Do we do that with God? Do, do, do we do this with all of the beauty that God has created? Do we find ourselves praising and worshiping God? Or do we just say, eh, can't stinking, stinking Biden, uh, this political thing, uh, stinking COVID, uh, oh my gosh, I can't, I, this, this world is so... Ch is that what we do? Sometimes I do. Like, it's just not, not the Biden thing, but because I pray for my presidents, no matter who they are. It's hard to find one that you wished you could have. But it, we, we ought to pray for them. Always pray. Always pray. But see, what is it that we're doing? Do we find ourselves worshiping, praising the Lord for who he is and all that he's made? Are we like Winston? Oh my gosh, look at that. Look at the bird. Oh my God, look at that sunrise. Look at the sunset. Or we, or we just go back to normal. So to glorify something means you're glorifying it because of its beauty. And listen, and you know that you have a duty. We have a duty to the Trinity, and that is to serve. You see, in the Trinity, God is defer. They're all, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're deferring to each other. There's no self-centeredness in them. There's absolute harmony and unity. They were, they were looking out. They're looking out for the best interest. There's zero friction. There's just constant, constant love from the one to the other. Not, not a love that, I'll, uh, it's just a love that gives. It's a give, it's a self-giving delight. It, they adore, they serve. Now, imagine this now. You say, Pastor, when is this sermon over? <laughs> I want to challenge you with something. If you just take some of the words, if you would align your heart, if you would align your life with the Trinity and allow that relationship to influence yours, everything will be amazing. Now, the last point. Ah, oh, finally, he's there. The invitation of the Trinity. Write that down. The inv Everybody say invitation. Invitation of the Trinity. You see... In each story, Genesis and Mark, in each story, there's a tree. Everybody say tree. In Genesis, and, and you know what? By the way, God wanted them to obey him about the tree. This is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm robbing from Tim, Tim Keller. Um, I, love, I love when he talks about this. He said to Adam, I want you to obey me about the tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you have all these yes trees. There's one no tree in the garden. Thousands of yes trees. The whole garden filled with them. There's one no tree. And then Adam gets the message. He knows it. Then the devil slips in. With the, the, the serpent slips in, the tempter. And he tempts him away from the dance with God. Adam and Eve had been dancing in the cool of the day with, with the Lord, just harmony, relationship. Not, I don't mean literal dancing. It could happen, but I'm talking about a relationship. And everything was going well until he didn't trust God and he thought that he could be just as smart as God. And so you see at that story, God, the Spirit, the Word, the water, and then in chapter 3, the devil. In Mark, you see God, the Father, the Spirit, the Word, the water, and then you see the devil. So let's go to Mark now. Mark, you see the Trinity's there. But then this is Jesus now, the last Adam. 
He's here to get us back into the relationship with God. So he's also got to go into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. In fact, except he's not in the garden. He's in the wilderness with the wild animals. So it's a lot harder. And he's there. And God says, I want you to obey me about the tree. Why? Because Satan was trying to get him off the track, the path to the cross. If, G if, you, if he was diverted from the cross, you and I could never claim that we're reconciled with God. We would be lost in our sin and we would not go to heaven. We couldn't. But Jesus was tempted away. The tempter was trying to get him off the dance and he wouldn't do it. He stayed the course. And so Jesus obeyed the Father about the tree, but this time the tree was not the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's the cross. He went to the cross for you and I. He went to the cross. And so here's what happened. Remember my high school dance experience when I talked about the wallflowers? Oh, did I tell you that? I remember being there like at the dance and I remember all these girls kind of just hanging around the wall waiting for a guy to invite them. This is, a, you got to remember this is the 70s, okay? And they're waiting and nobody's bringing them. Nobody invited them to the dance. I'm going to tell you something. And by the way, I felt bad for them, but I, I never did invite them either. I got to tell you something. My, my, my granddaughter Josie, this reminded me of the story. On Sundays, she comes, Seth and Renee's daughter. Can we have the picture of Josie? Um, and she is only like, how old? One and a half, Josie. This is Josie. Do we have a zoomed in version? No. This is Josie. She's full of life. And every time she comes in, she says, Alexa, let it go. That's the Frozen song. We play this over and over. By the way, when I preached this, Gail was listening at the first service. And when I said it online, Alexa played, let it go. That's crazy. So she does that. And then what she, she has an agenda. Then she walks over to me with her head bowed. She gets right up to my knees. She fidgets with her hands because she feels like a wallflower, but she's hoping that I'll pick her up and take her on the dance. And guess what Papa does every single time? Every time. Sometimes like 10 times on one Sunday or more. We play Let It Go and Waymaker, by the way. If you're, if you're at home, Alexa, Waymaker. Let's hear worship instead of Frozen. Okay. And, and I reach down. I swoop her up. I put her in my arms, and we dance a mighty dance through the den, through the kitchen. And I want you to know something. You will never be a wallflower in God's presence. The Bible says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Every time. Every time. Maybe you've been running. You've been hiding. You've been... You've been sitting way back in the room on the tables, and you just don't know if he will accept you. I'm here to tell you, I don't care what secret sin you have, what your past has been like. You have a God that loves you, that went through Jesus. God, Jesus went to the cross for you. He gave up everything for you. He will bring you back in if you would draw near to him. In the first service, we had three people that decided they wanted to draw near to God. And God drew near to them. And I want to know if there's anybody here. You'd like to draw near to Jesus. You know that he, at the cross, he made a way. He paid the price. He, he, he asked, he, he went forward for you and died on, for your sins. Your sins are completely paid for. God so loved the world that he gave. He so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So simply put, what we do every week is, I lead people in a heartfelt prayer between you and God to respond to the invitation to say yes to God, whether you're online or whether you're right here. And it's very quick. Just admit you're a sinner. Believe Jesus died for your sins and rose again and confess that he's Lord. Let's do that right out loud. Right out loud. Father God, I am a sinner. I humbly come to you, Lord, to receive your grace, your forgiveness. So I repent for my sin. I believe 
it was paid for at the cross. I believe you rose again and you are in power and victory with the Trinity. So I confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.